you must be the master of your own kingdom. As long as you enjoy your job, then it's not work. If you don't let your mind get in the way too much, then things seem to sort of run smoothly. Need motivation? Watch a top 10 with Believe Nation. What's up at seven? My one word is believe and I believe in you. I believe you have an amazing gift inside you that I wanna see explode out onto the world. So let's get your motivation to a 10 and get you believing in you. Grab a snack and chew on today's lessons from a man who went from being dyslexic and expelled from high school at age 15 to becoming a filmmaker and creating films like Sherlock Holmes and Snatch. He's Guy Ritchie and here's my take on his top 10 rules of success. Enjoy. All right, let's kick things off with rule number one, my personal favorite, own the game. If you don't own something, you're not the boss. You have to take full responsibility for everything that you do. Why be subservient? You must be the master of your own kingdom. feel you. Makes a lot of sense. You've got to own that. You can't just walk into things with your eyes half open. You got to walk into things with your eyes fully open. You got to know what you're getting into. You have to take possession of your life. Is this a thought process that you have to constantly reaffirm or yes. is this cemented Exa in your exactly head? It's exactly that. It's exactly that. It, you drift on this point. Right. And it is whatever form of meditation or mantra that you decide to espouse, there needs to be some period in your day where you remember that there's a world out there trying to tell you who you are and there's a world in here that's trying to tell you who you are now where do you want to put your eggs because the world outside is very noisy and very tempting and as all the razzmatazz as all the tinsel and all the glitter it's got all the toys but that's because you don't think you're enough in the first place ah uh. If you don't think you're enough in the first place, the whole idea of the world to sell you stuff is, first of all, they have to make you feel bad about yourself, less than in some way. And I don't resent this system, by the way. It is the system. But what's the expression about don't hate, don't hate the, the player. player, hate the game? Don't hate the game. Love the game because you're in it, mate. Mm. So own the game, accept the rules, and move on into the rules. So the world will try and tell you who you are and you have to tell yourself who you are. And there's this ongoing battle. And somehow there needs to be a reconciliation between the two. But in the end, you've got to have all the eggs in your basket. Rule number two is survive failure. Dude, I did, made a film called Swept Away, which I got annihilated for. And then uh, I did Revolver, which I got, that was the second barrel, the first barrel they took me out of, of, with uh, with Swept Away and then the second barrel revolver. And I tell you, that was nearly the end of my career. Well, I was naive. Uh, and but part of the process of about becoming a filmmaker is to find out how naive you are. So, uh, I, I mean, I love uh, Revolver. Um, uh, however, I do appreciate it. It's relatively esoteric to understand. Um, and I like Swept Away. So I don't regret either of them. But if you were the sort of... The thing is, is who knows what's the best way to play your cards? I've no idea, really. You play the cards that you play, and then in the end, you sort of summarize where they played in the right place, and I'd, I'd have to say that they probably were, you know? The question is, is can, can you sustain confidence while you're taking a kicking? Uh, I mean, it's like- Could you? Uh, no, no, you lose your confidence. <laughs> And then you start again and you try and build it up again. But, you know, that's the human story, isn't it? I mean, it's all our, it's all our stories, really. Rule number three, enjoy your job. I had a Norwegian actor with you, Kalle Henne. He was playing one of the Vikings. Yeah, he's, he's a big guy. Yes. He yeah. said you're the nicest person on set. And as a director too, you're so nice. So how do you keep your cool all the time when you have all these... You know, all these people that you had to tell what to well, do. Well, I've got a, a, a lot of people to keep my cool for me, really. Um, I think if you, as long as you enjoy your job, then it's not work. So I don't find it particularly taxing uh, doing my job. Um, and I'm there for, you know, we were there for five months or 
whatever it was we were making this movie for. So I think if you lose your temper once, you're likely to lose it twice. Um, but I'd rather enjoy my day, so I make a conscious effort to have a positive mental attitude. Um, and then that picks up momentum, you know? And then you just got to set, set a tone and then you stick to that tone. Rule number four, realize your own value. So there's a father. He has two sons, an older son, a younger son. And he says to them, who wants to spend their inheritance? The younger son says, me, dad, I'll go and spend it. And the younger son takes all the dough and he runs off and sniffs coke off strippers' tits for a number of years until he realizes this is getting pretty boring and I'm in a lot of trouble. He ends up feeding, throwing food to pigs. That's his job. And he can't even eat the food that he gives to the pigs, at which point he says, Dad, will you take me back? Dad then goes to, they don't meet. This somehow happens, not through telephones, it just happens. At which point, Dad goes to the fatty calf, says, kill the fatty calf. Older son says, hold on, Dad, what's going on? I've stayed with you since the beginning. I've been loyal to you. And I hear the stories of my younger brother coming back, who's been sniffing coke off strippers' tits for the last half, God knows how many years. And you're prepared to kill the fatty calf. What's the SP, Dad? I want to know the story. He says, you're right, son. Don't worry about that. You take a little side, a little step to the side. You'll always be with me. You're a good boy. At which point he goes out to meet the prodigal son, the wasteful son. The wasteful son returns and he says, you were lost and now you're found. That's the end of the story. It's quite hard to make sense of that in a literal sense. You go, oh, dad was a bit unfair and you should have been kind to the older son because he never ran off and did anything. But the essence of the story is that you are the father. You are enough. Your older son is your intellect. He says, oh, don't do this, don't do that. He's trying to reconcile, make sense of a prosaic and material world. The younger son, being the wild, feral entity that he is, wants to go out in the world and find out what it's all about. So in his recklessness and sense of adventure, he finds that he can't escape himself. So he has to return to himself. And at which point, he has to accept who he is. At which point, the intellect is left out of the equation pretty much as the older brother, because he can't understand the significance of the journey of the wasteful brother. In the end, you have to leave yourself to understand the value of yourself. You have to lose stuff before you realize that all the stuff that you're losing is ephemeral and transitory. It's not yours. You're enough. You're always enough. But you've got to somehow prostitute yourself before you realize your own value. That is the essence of all stories. Rule number five, always commit fully. Do you have moments on the set, even as you've done it three, four times now, movies with budgets like this, where you look around and you think back to the days on Lockstock, where you look, you look around and you say, how did Lockstock take me here? Uh, yes and no. It's a funny thing because zeros, some terribly clever person explained zeros are zeros because they ultimately amount to zero. Um, and there's some truth in that, that uh, a, a creative job is a creative job. And I think you probably spend as much time on a job that costs 10,000 bucks as you do on a job that costs 10 million. Um, because it's just, you commit to the job, and once you've committed to it, the zeros are irrelevant. Uh, and I still find that now. So I'm not intimidated by zeros, funny enough. Um, I probably would be with, when it comes to, you know, lots of people looking at you, the more people uh, that you're having an interview in front of becomes intimidating. But money and, um, and films, it's not intimidating. Rule number six, be your own audience. The film I pitched, I think, was not the film we ended up with. Um, we have a theory on this that films pretty much set their own pace at a certain point. My job is to steer the head of the tiger. And after a couple of weeks, you start feeling out what the nature of it is, and then it tells you what it's going to be. So the first film we shot was three and a half hours long. And then halfway through it, I fell asleep. Um, and I realized I had to do some work. 
And, that wasn't uh, one of my scenes, just uh, <laughs> I had a cliff note in there. And uh, so I realised there was a bit of work that needed to be done. And uh, inevitably ended up being almost half that time. And uh, because of that, it, it does take on an energy. But that energy was really is there to sustain my interest as much as it is anyone else's. I know if I'm entertained, then I suspect other people will be. There's nothing worse than watching a film going, oh, that's a good scene, but I don't care. And uh, there was a little bit of that that went on. So we truncated it and then bish bash bosh wonky donkey, we got it working. Rule number seven, only do things you're interested in. If there is a, a script that's unauthorized biopic, if there's a slew of them happening right now, is that something that people can bring as a director? Do you bring it to a, a film? Um, I, I can only be get excited by things that I can get excited by. And, and really, I think that takes place unconsciously. Um, so if someone went King Arthur, it depends when they're going to catch me. Mm -hmm. But if it's King Arthur and I've just seen a commercial or some incarnation in this genre, you go, oh, there's bits of that that I quite like and I think I could do, I could do a job on that. Mm -hmm. So that, that's really what happens. So by the time this came out, a few people had been talking about King Arthur. I was a big mm -hmm. fan of King Arthur. I saw a couple of things and I went, oh, right, if I could do that, 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 that and create the tone, mm -hmm. then uh, we're off to the races and I think I can do a job with that. Rule number eight, get your mind out of the way. In sport, as soon as you start thinking about what it is that you're doing, it all goes tits up. But if you don't let your mind get in the way too much, then things seem to sort of run smoothly. And I think the creative process is very much like that. Initially, you need to sort of define what your creative barriers are going to be, and then you've just got to forget it. And then in intuitively uh, let it roll, so to speak. Rule number nine, find your creative process. I was in the theater last night and I was freaking out when, the, when he finally takes that sword and does the slow-mo scenes taking down the bad guys. I'm just curious as a filmmaker how that is filmed, what he looks like when he's shooting it. Are you going around him in like a 360? How, how do you shoot those moments? Yeah, I mean that scene particularly was, I, I, I walked into that with my eyes blind because I wasn't really sure exactly what I was going to do once he pulled the sword. We had all sorts of different ideas about what was going to happen, but the truth was, Everything that we'd come up with before, you know, wasn't really working. So I cobbled it together bit by bit, which I do quite a lot of my filmmaking, is that you have an idea of what's gonna work. You're just not sure exactly what's gonna work. So you throw enough energy, give it enough information and something, you know, stick it in the oven and uh, something always comes out. So it was really a sort of an amalgam of ideas. And then, you know, like I say, you sort of sieve them. And then it really, these things, they make themselves. My job is to sort of be a bit of a chef um, and try and get the components in the, yeah. in the ingredients. There's a lot of metaphors going on there, sorry. <laughs> and rule number 10, the last one before the bonus clip, is have fun. What was the funniest kind of moment on set? And I feel like Charlie was the, like, the goofball on set, but like if, like who was, or, yeah. Mm -hmm. Charlie, over to you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you Wake very me much, up guy. when you finished. <laughs> I'm not actually the goofball. I tend to be very, very earnest and serious about my process with acting, and Guy recognized this very early, and I think it made him uh, quite nervous. And he said, all right, sunshine, uh, that's this whatever you do in Daniel Day-Lewis impersonation or whatever it is, uh, you, can, you can put that to the side because we have to have fun every day. And if we're having fun and making each other laugh, then the audience will have fun and we'll be making them laugh. So that was his main direction to me was just stop taking yourself so seriously and have a bit of fun. The random Guy Ritchie geezer name generator is a unique physical characteristic about yourself and your dad's first name. Now, I'll give you mine. I get trigger finger, right, it's weird. I wake up with a finger down like that every morning. And my dad's called Will, so I'm Finger Tringer Will. Now, uh, Charlie went with 12 inch uh, Billy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I've That was left... predictable and silly. I was just gonna call, call myself Massive <laughs> John. <laughs> no, but... Oh, that's sorry, the exact... I got that wrong, no. sorry. Yeah, but that's, he went 12 inch Billy, so you can't both, you can't both have the same physical characteristic. Or if well, you that's always you, we're, we're on the same frequency. <laughs> really, clearly quite a childish one. So you have to have another one, because I won't be able to play All that. right, okay, so... Something else, so, you've got big ears, have you got, what's your... Uh, oh, they're a bit collied my ears. Perfect. Uh, all right, so let's go, so we go collie-eared, and then I find my dad's Christian poor name. No, no, just his first name. 
Oh, J- John, John or Vivian? Is it John Vivian? John Vivian, yeah. So Let's go for a Vivian. I quite like Collier Vivian. Vivian. Well, mate, Collier, John, John, John Collier, John, John Collier. Wow, that's yeah. John Collier. Yeah, it's I mean, been, it sounds, sounds a bit sort of boring now. It's not as good as Bullet Tooth Tony, is it? You know. <laughs> come on, we can do better than this. <laughs> yeah, come on. Um, beard, you got a beard. Let's go with that. Let's go with stubble, stubble faced John. There you go. <laughs> that's poo. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I do have? What do you have? I have different coloured eyes. Brilliant. All right. One's green, one's brown. Right, blue, brown, John. Not bad. Blue, brown, Vivian. Because <laughs> that means you wouldn't know if it's a woman or a man. I quite like that. All right, I quite like that. Blue, brown, Vivian. Blue, brown, Vivian. Vivian. Blue, brown, Vivian. There you go. Yeah, good. I prefer right. massive <laughs> John myself. <laughs> <laughs> Now I've got a special bonus Guy Ritchie clip on challenging yourself, but before that, my question of the day, I wanna have a little bit of fun with you guys. Go back to the last clip, rule number 10, and have fun. I wanna know what your geezer name would be. Leave it down in the comments below. I'm excited to see what you have to say. Thank you guys so much for watching. I believe in you. I hope you continue to believe in yourself and whatever your one word is, much love. I'll see you soon and enjoy the bonus clip. I've sort of built up a momentum of enjoying challenges, which previously I would have found too intimidating. Um, and I've sort of built up a bit of, com- directing is mostly about confidence. Um, and I've built up a sort of a confidence that, oh, I don't know how to do that genre. Can I have a go at that genre? I don't know how to do that genre. Can I have a go at that genre? And that's really what's happened because I could, you know, I, I was weaned on, um, urban, London, small gangster stuff, and I was comfortable in that world. And to try and get out of that, hard, and you know, the, with the Sherlock, what happened was, is someone presented. Uh, I said because I was being too fussy about what I was trying to do. And I thought, hold on, my mind's getting in the way here too much. And I said, the next script that turns up on my desk, I'm going to make it. And the next script that turned up was Sherlock Holmes. So I thought, oh, how was this going to? how much of a challenge is this going to provide? I did like Sherlock Holmes as a kid, which was advantageous, but it was a completely new world for me. But after I made that, I could see the correlations between that which I was familiar with and how much you could do that was unfamiliar, but was exciting, and you didn't overstretch. And then, well, I thought, after I did that, I thought, well, why don't we take a sojourn into the 60s with Man From U.N.C.L.E.? Um, and now, you know, you feel quite confident there, and they, well, why not now go back to the 8th century and have a go at King Arthur? So, as I say, that's really confidence. Raise your standard. Apple at the core, its core value, is that we believe that people with passion can change the world for the better. Not one drop of my self-worth depends on your acceptance of me. I don't ever give up. I'd have to be dead or completely incapacitated. Hey Believe Nation, if you want to see my all-time favorite top 10 rules of success, I have a very special secret video for you. These are the individual clips that I have personally learned the most from and applied to my life and my business. Check the link in the description for details.